What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of The Vile Files. I am your host, Nick, and we have a special episode because we have a special new person joining our show, uh, a new pr- new producer, uh, my friend, Chrissy. Chrissy, say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. Uh, Hello, my friend, Nick. I'm so happy that you are joining uh, us. Uh, for those who might not have listened to yesterday's episode with uh, Caitlin in the Listen to Your Heart recap, uh, Rochelle, sadly and unfortunately, uh, is, has decided to move on from the show. And we wish her nothing but the best and thank her for all the hard work she has done uh, to help make the Vile Files what it is today. And uh, we will certainly <clears throat> look to have her back in the future, uh, maybe to, to recap some Bachelor stuff and, and just check in on seeing how she's doing. And, and again, we wish her nothing but great uh, success uh, and all the things that she is working on and all the talents that she has. So, uh, Chrissy. Welcome to the team. Uh, excited to be working Thanks with you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I look forward to you guys getting to know Chrissy uh, throughout the episodes. And uh, yeah, we're just uh, we're excited to have you. Thanks. We're going to ease into it, right? Uh, going to ease into it. Yeah, Chrissy is a, <laughs> a lovable, wonderful person with uh, some great stories. And as, as we all have uh, our own trials and tribulations when it comes to our love lives. So we only welcome misfits on this show, Chrissy. I don't know what you're talking about. My love life has been perfect forever. <laughs> well, you're you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Tragically. Uh. Um, but uh, before we get to our guest today, which is an incredible interview with the very talented Laura Morano, uh, I did want to uh, address what happened over the weekend uh, with the things that uh, we saw uh, on Hannah Brown's Instagram. And... Uh, you know, obviously, during my questions with Nick, um, I had kind of an initial reaction, just kind of stating uh, that obviously it's very disappointing to see. Uh, and I certainly wanted to give it some time, <clears throat> you know, to, to think about uh, what I wanted to say, how I want to address it. Obviously, you know, Rachel uh, did an Instagram live and gave her thoughts. Rachel actually is going to be joining us for our Ask Nick episode next Monday, and we will uh, get into in a little deeper conversation uh, with her. Uh, about this topic and specifically uh, the use of the N word, um, uh, the history behind it, uh, why it's not okay to ever say it uh, if you're uh, not a black person. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a lyric in a song. Um, it is. I'll be honest. It's a, it's been uh, disappointing to see some people's reactions. Listen, I, I understand um, there are a lot of people who are fans of Hannah Brown. Um, and when you're a fan of someone, your initial reaction is to want to defend them. Uh, I understand that. Um, but the reality is it, it is not okay in any context, in any situation whatsoever, uh, to say that word. And uh, I am very critical of, of Hannah Brown's use of that word. And just like when I was critical of Madison a couple weeks ago, listen, Hannah Brown has a massive platform. Um, she has been very outspoken about her desire to be a role model, uh, to specifically to young women out there. Um, she has talked about a lot, you know, when I was a young girl, this, when I was a young girl, that, and quite frankly, uh, her going on Instagram live, whether she was inebriated or not, and using that word in any context whatsoever is absolutely not being a role model. Certainly not a good one. Um, not whatsoever. And she has to be held to a high standard. Um, we, we all do. Um, and it, it is very disappointing to see. Um, I got to say her, her, her initial response was, was disappointing. I, I know she has since uh, issued a written apology on her Instagram. Now, just for context, I am recording this Monday morning. You won't be listening to this to, uh, until Wednesday. So uh, we might see... <clears throat> uh, further response from Hannah Brown as it relates to this topic. And I, I hope that we do. Uh, so just know that if she does, um, uh, I'm speaking on this uh, uh, Monday morning. And listen, I, I get it, people, in the sense that, <clears throat> you know, uh, I don't think Hannah Brown is a racist um, from the little bit I know. Um, and I understand, and, and it's it, we're, we we live in such a de, de divisive times right now, especially when it comes to races. Still, you know, I see a lot of people, a lot of fans of of, of Hannah out there saying, "Well, she was just singing the song," and 
you know, she's sorry, she's apologetic, and she's not racist. And again, she's not racist. I don't think she's racist, but what she said was very ignorant, right? And I think we have to not be afraid to use that word ignorant. We have done and said ignorant things, all of us, right? I've seen a lot of responses out there from people saying, let's not pretend that we haven't ourselves saying it, uh, th said this word in the privacy of our car. Listen, if you have, it's not okay. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make you a racist, but it, it is an ignorant thing to do. And I think the important thing here is like, we're so quick, especially as white people, to get very defensive. Like, I'm not a racist. I'm not a racist. But I think the real important thing we need to start thinking about is, are you an ally, right? Are you an ally to people who are different from you? Um, what I mean by being an ally is, you know, being a friend, learning about people's point of views that are different than you. Uh, people who have uh, a, a long history of oppression. Uh, Rachel talked about the use of the N-word, why artists are using it in songs, why, why black people uh, are saying and taking their power back in the use of the word. A word that is being used uh, against a, a group of people for hundreds of years to enslave, rape, murder, and do countless atrocities towards them. So if all we have to do as white people is simply not say the word out loud, even if it's in a lyric of a song, a song that, like, again, if a black artist wants to use it to express themselves, they have the right to do that, all right? And again, if, if, if me saying that, uh, you have a hard time processing it, don't get defensive, but ask yourself, am I being an ally, right? Am I doing enough to, to learn about people who are different from me? Uh, listen, I've talked a lot about my childhood uh, on this show, of uh, great parents, uh, things like that. But I also grew up in a very white community. Now, uh, my parents were always open and invited diversity into our lives when, when possible through our church, through athletics. But regardless, that was still limited. It was a really white world that I grew up in. And as a result, when you isolate yourself, uh, isolation breeds ignorance, right? I think back on my childhood and I think back on uh, coaches I interacted with, people and people I respected, good people that said and taught me what I now have come to learn were ignorant. And I'm ashamed to have ever thought that or maybe even said it as a teenager. And I'm thankful like I, I wasn't, uh, social media wasn't out there. And I'm not ashamed to, to admit that I have had ignorant thoughts before. I'm very thankful that I have, throughout the years of my life, opened up the world around me um, to become more educated and to try to be an ally for people who are different from me. If you're a man, you should wanna be an ally to women. If you are straight, you should wanna be an ally to the LGBTQ community. If you are a white person, you should wanna be an ally to people of color. And by doing that, to better understand them, to ask them questions, to reach out to people who are different than you and, and see if they're willing to teach you. Now keep in mind, People who uh, are minorities are pretty exhausted and tired of, of trying to explain themselves. So like in any situation, if you want to learn, you do have to be willing to do the work on your own. But I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who are willing to, to, to talk about it. Uh, you know, for example, if you are interested in learning more about and you want to be an ally, uh, then listen to the Maya podcast on Monday with Rachel and listen to Rachel talk about uh, the history of that word and, and let's all get educated on it. There's something I'm more, most thankful of this podcast are the guests I've had in the show to continue to educate me on things. Um, we shouldn't be so afraid to uh, acknowledge that we can be ignorant and we can learn from it. I don't think Hannah Brown should be canceled. You know, I've got a lot of message too saying, Let's cancel Hannah Brown. You know how I feel about the cancel culture. I don't think there's a lot of positives that come from it. This is a learning opportunity, hopefully, for Hannah. Um, let's see how she responds. So far, her response hasn't been great, but I personally am willing to see uh, how she handles this. Like it or not, Hannah Brown is, continued, is going to continue to be a role model. The question is, is she going to be a good one? right? She still has a massive following, and this is such a divisive topic, that there are going to be people who are going to side with Hannah Brown regardless, right? The big question is, these young women who look up to her, who support her, uh, is she going to go out of her way to say, this was wrong, and to really double down, to really embrace her mistake and learn from it, and not hide behind her fans that want to defend her? You know, if you are a fan of Hannah Brown, you should not be defending this, right? Uh, 
if you're Hannah Brown, you should not want your fans to defend you. I hope that between the time I'm saying this and the time you're hearing this, uh, Hannah Brown goes on back on her platform and asks the fans who are defending her and saying things like I, she was just singing it in a song to stop doing that because it's not okay. And she has a responsibility to do that. And she has an opportunity to do that. And again, to continue to, to talk to say people like Rachel or her friend Katie or the other people of color in Bachelor Nation and other people of color who aren't in Bachelor Nation. Uh, and then to use this platform, this massive platform that she has to learn from her mistake and, uh, you know, be better about it. But um, she has to be held accountable. And it was a really kind of off-putting response, um, you know, when she got called out on Instagram Live. I mean, for those of you who didn't see it, I'll just read it. Um, you know, when someone said, you know, she got called out and you know, she seemed pretty inebriated, but that's that's not a, uh, an excuse. That might be the reason. Uh, she said, we don't say that word. So you know what? I'm going to stay here and you all can think I said whatever I did or think I'm not, I'm something I'm not, but I'm not that. Look, people are going to want to think whatever they want to think of me, get mad at me, whatever. And even if I did accidentally say it, I'm very sorry. I was singing a song and not even thinking. Listen, if you're going to apologize, don't ever use the word whatever, right? <laughs> it's just void, <laughs> whatever you're saying in regards to an apology. And uh, she has since posted a written apology in her Instagram stories that is set to expire. Uh, that's not like, as Rachel said on her Instagram live, like that, that doesn't read as sincere, uh, we don't know whether she, that came from her heart or if it came from her publicist. Um, so the only authentic reaction right now, as it stands this Monday morning, is what she just said on Instagram Live. And quite frankly, that's a really, really terrible apology and really insincere. And it comes across as, again, ignorant to what she's speaking on. Um I don't think Hannah Brown, I think Hannah Brown has a lot of good in her. I think she has a lot of opportunities to uh, have this be a teachable moment and and turn it into a positive thing. And I, I hope she embraces that and, and not hopes that this situation goes away. Um, and I think this all can be a teachable moment for all of us. And uh, I, I hope that she uh, she does that. Uh, I have a question for you. How do you think bachelor nation like in an overall sense of how they view how do you think they view hannah as a person beforehand uh, and how this will change that yeah i mean listen uh that will be interesting if i'm being uh, a totally candid i know you know throughout the past episodes we've had hannah brown on this podcast she was awesome when she was on and, and very authentic and i really enjoyed talking to her and I know some people have suggested I've kind of snarked towards Hannah Brown um, since then. Uh, listen, the, the, to be perfectly candid, um, there are several alumni in Bachelor Nation who have had, uh, I guess the best way I can put it, off-putting experiences with Hannah Brown. Right. Um, nothing in lines with what we just talked about, uh, more in line with, you know, the typical... Um, someone's feeling themselves a little extra. And listen, we've all been there, especially as leads. Uh, there's always been moments where maybe we, we needed to be checked. Um, but with Hannah, it seemed to be the norm. Like It's like everyone you talk to in Bachelor Nation had their uh, Hannah Brown story. And it was kind of along, like, I guess it was more disappointing because in the sense that for a lot of people, including myself, we're very like, Hannah Brown supporters, in a sense. Like, you saw this girl, a uh, young woman on, on Colton season, the misfit, the misunderstood, the authentically raw and, and sweet and humble. And then you meet Hannah and you're just like, that's not the person you're, you're, you're projecting and that you say you want to be. Um, you know, that's kinda, to kind of put it in terms, you know, if you watched Colton season, the, the, the Hannah Brown story was, it was Hannah Brown versus uh, Kaylin. Right. right, right, right. And, and, and a lot of people's opinions, including myself, was Hannah Brown was the, again, misunderstood, you know. Uh, girl from the, the South, the out, nice girl. The, the outcast, you know, not the, you're not like the outsider. A little awkward. A little awkward. Yeah, yeah. And then Kaylin was the 
um, very pretty, very calculated, mean girl. And right. after you got to meet Kaylin and Hannah in person, it couldn't have been more the opposite. Hannah, Kaylin was the sweet, quiet, misunderstood, very pleasant, very kind person, and Hannah was the mean girl. Um, and a lot of and, and the reason why you haven't heard uh, that from Bachelor people, to be totally honest, is they're afraid of Hannah and her fans, and specifically, they've uh, are afraid of Hannah's willingness to steer her fans' energy in the direction of her critics. Um, and that's why you haven't heard it. I would suspect you're not going to see or hear a lot of people come out. Um, and, well, this is it's an indefensible thing, but I don't think you're going to see a ton of support for Hannah Brown and Batch Nation. Obviously, uh, you know this this relationship and whatever it is with Tyler and and uh, Matt James and the, yeah. the TikTok crew, but she doesn't <laughs> have a lot of friends in in uh, in Bachelor Nation. And that doesn't mean she can't. It's a very forgiving world. Um, this might be a humbling experience for Hannah. And again, I don't mean to, uh, to I'm not trying to shit on Hannah here, but this, uh, uh, that is, you know, that has been disappointing to see. And I guess to answer your question, I don't expect an overwhelming, well, you know, deep down Hannah is, you know, th like there, there's a lot of conversations behind closed doors yesterday about, about you, Hannah. Have, have other people reached out to you? Have other yeah, I mean, reached out to you to talk about it? There's a lot of conversations of, you know, uh, really, this is really sad and tragic and um, I, I don't feel bad for her. You know? And that's sad. Uh, because I do think Hannah is a good person. I do think she has a kind heart and I think she, again, um, can do a lot of good with her platform. But yeah. she really needs to own this and she needs to own, truly own up to her mistakes. And so far, again, as of Monday morning, she has not. And she definitely needs to do better. And yeah. according to Rachel, and Rachel reached out to her, gave her I some advice. That. And it sounds like Hannah dismissed that. Who knows? You know, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll ask Rachel about that and, um, and get more, maybe more context. But again, I just want to say that when we have Rachel on, it's going to be less about Hannah Brown and more about the bigger conversation of trying to, you know, get more context around this topic, you know, specifically the use of the N-word, why artists, black artists use it, uh, or black people, um, and why it's in no way an excuse or ever okay for, for white people to ever use it, right? It's not that hard, people, to, you're like, really? Are you really going to die on that hill to say, like, if they can't, if they, we, if... If we can't say it, no one should say it. It's just like, no, no, wrong take. Uh, it, but Rachel's example of that was amazing when she like changed it around and was like, okay, now take that and compare it with the word bitch. Mm -hmm. And that whole comparison, even if you're, doesn't matter what color you are, you can get it. Yes, right? Because... You know, I mean, I'll be admitted. I've I've used I've joked around and used the word bitch before. I don't think it has sure. quite the same weight, but at the same time, I it's a it was a great analogy it's a good for, to try to yeah. spread like yes, yep. women use it a lot more frequently with other women to take that power back to that word, yep. right? And they use it is it a, a, even a term of endearment? Uh, when a guy says it, uh, it's not the same, right? Like it is not it, even like when I have attempted to say it as a joke, I'm always like, like I, don't, like, I, I better really know this person. Um, and again, like that, you know, it's uh, so, yes. I mean, again, I just encourage people try not to feel defensive, right? Because I get it, right? You see Hannah Brown say this word, you're a fan of her. Then you think to yourself, oh, maybe, I mean, I've, like, I've rapped, I've, I've, I've said it in, like, a private, I'm not a racist, so you want to defend Hannah for that. Listen, it's an ignorant thing to do. We've, we've been there, we've done and said ignorant things. Let's try to be allies, right? How can we be allies to people who are different from us? How can we educate ourselves to understand the point of view of people who, um, 
had to deal with a lot of trials and tribulations more than we have. And I encourage you all to try to be allies to people. And if we can try to do that, I think we will have a better place. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be in a better world. Like we're still living in a time where a young man was gunned down, uh, Amon Ar- uh, Aubrey, um, by two vigilantes who, like, I listen, it's safe to say that there was racial bias there, you know? Like, it's not okay. And this is, we, we have to fight this. This is systemic, right? And again, when I referred to, you know, when I was heard things growing up from, from coaches, like, I didn't think they're racist, but again, this is systemic. This is like, you, you live in a, a whitewashed world and it's just easy to, like, just make crazy assumptions and then you hear them. And you're like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Sure, fuck it. And then you repeat that somewhere else to another friend, and all of a sudden you have this thought process. We have to try to, again, educate ourselves. You know, don't learn from other people in your very isolated group. Seek out people who are different. Again, invite diversity in your world. Don't be afraid to have your point of view change and understand other people's point of views who are different than you. I hope that uh, we can all learn from this. I hope this is a teachable moment. I hope we all challenge ourselves, especially if we feel defensive, either towards ourselves or towards Hannah, uh, to just try to, again, how can, stop, how can I be an ally? How can I learn more about this topic? Um, and again, you can still be a fan of Hannah and still be critical of her actions, you know? It's, it's not black and white that way. Don't feel like you have to uh, ignore what she did in order to be a fan of hers. Um, and uh, I hope that we all, again, as a, a, a community, Bachelor Nation, uh, as a world, we'll, we'll learn from this. And um, I guess that's all I have to say about that. Well said. Uh, whew, heavy stuff. Um, anyways, uh, Laura Morano is our guest. <laughs> Not heavy. <laughs> Not heavy. Well, delightful, lovely, uh, fun-hearted delightful. conversation. Uh, actually, good friend of Chrissy. Chrissy already uh, doing some great work <laughs> and, and, and booking her friend, uh, Laura, who is an incredibly talented uh, actor, a musician, a writer. Uh, she does it all. She's been doing it her entire life. Um, she has some new songs out. Uh, she's been in uh, a lot of great movies and TV shows. We talk about that, her dating life, um, uh, her sp- perspective on the world as a, as a young woman, and I think you will really enjoy it. So, uh, yeah, uh, don't forget to send your questions at asknick at castmedia.com, cast with a K, for our Ask Nick episodes. Again, uh, Rachel Lindsay will be joining us next Monday to do the Ask Nick, um, but we'll, we'll probably start the conversation and, and learning a little bit more. And I invite you all to, to tune in with an open mind. Uh, without judgment uh, of yourselves and just a desire to learn uh, of how we can all be better and all be uh, more aware of, of, of things like racism and, and things how we can avoid ignorant situations and, and ways that we can support our community, support Hannah and ourselves. True Botanicals, new friend of show. Listen, uh, we always talk about quality products on this show. Uh, you know I believe very much in what goes into these products, uh, especially when it comes to natural habits. True Botanicals is right up that alley uh, with doing amazing work when it comes to your skincare. Isn't that right, Chrissy? That is right. I just got it, started using the product, and I already love the difference between having a lotion and putting an oil on my face. It's such so different to have less toxins going into my skin. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's. You know, anything you're you're putting on your body, on your skin, um, something, again, I've said this before, your skin is your largest organ. I don't know if you know that, people. I've said it before, but in case you're tuning in for the first time, your skin is your largest organ. Anything you put on your skin absorbs into your body, into your bloodstream. So you always want to make sure you're putting the, the safest, best quality products on your body because it's going in your body. And, and given what's going on in the world today, like, why not focus on your skin and your health, right? True botanical products can be calming during these stressful times and are delivered straight to your door. So that's convenience. Obviously, we believe in convenience. We love that on the show. Producer and director of True Botanicals enthusiast Olivia Wilde says True Botanicals is a skincare line she wishes she had in her 20s. Laura Dern is a big believer in True Botanicals, using it on her skin, keeping those toxins out, believing that what goes in your body is just as important as what goes on your skin. 
Yeah, every True Botanicals formula is made safe certified without 5,000 plus known toxin ingredients. So that's 5,000 known toxin ingredients that usually end up in the lotions that you're putting into your body on your skin that True Botanicals does not have. So that is something that is very important and uh, you should want uh, when it comes to things that you're putting on your skin. So uh, you've got to try True Botanicals for yourself. Get 15% off your first purchase at truebotanicals.com slash V-I-A-L-L. Get 15% off your first purchase at truebotanicals.com slash V-I-A-L-L. truebotanicals.com slash V-I-A-L-L. Magic spoon. Listen, uh, I love cereal. I love cereal. Uh, I don't know uh, when I was growing up that, you know, sometimes, uh, it, to me, I eat cereal now as a dessert, right? Uh, and then I, I discovered Magic Spoon. And once again, I felt like I was eating something I love without the guilt of, of eating a ton of it. Because Magic Spoon, what it is, is grain-free cereal. Uh, I don't know what you, what you know about grains, but they're not necessarily health, healthy for us. They cause inflammation into our body. Uh, it doesn't matter if, if you're allergic to grains or have celiacs. Like, it's not really healthy for any of us. Uh, my doctor is constantly telling me to eat less grains. Hard to do because I love grains. But... When you are eating Magic Spoon, you're eating delicious cereal, grain-free, so it, uh, it's also got zero sugar. Sugar destroys your body. It does. It destroys my body. If I'm being honest, I eat a box at a time. I mean, it's not the biggest box. And, I, and then when I do, I don't feel bad about it because I don't eat any grains. I don't have any sugar. And it has protein in it. My favorite is the uh, fruity cereal. I also love how they keep their uh, packaging and designs. It's, it's just fruity. It says fruity. That's all. That's all you need to know. It's delicious. It's fruity. It's grain free. It's Magic Spoon. So go to magicspoon.com slash V I A L L to grab a variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use our promo code V I A L L at checkout to get free shipping. And Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money. No questions asked. That's magicspoon.com slash V-I-A-L-L. And use the code V-I-A-L-L for free shipping. We thank Magic Spoon for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, how's it going, Laura? Ah, it's good. Um, I, I feel like I've reached a new level of tired where it's just full pep. No, um, the, the past exhaustion phase where you're, you're kind of a little crazy so I'm excited for this interview. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's going to be fun. I'm uh, I I too am have gotten more and more lethargic uh, throughout this quarantine. Even this morning, I, uh, I I I indulged a little bit too much last night. I don't know why, but um, so yeah, I'm, I'm I'm dragging ass. But also, like I'm just kind of dragging ass through the. I get my work done. I'm a little bit more efficient because I don't have to commute, and then I have less last day left and I'm just kind of like I guess I'll just do the same thing as I did yesterday and I'll just sit on my couch 100%. It's uh, crazy. My um my boyfriend and I are doing this healthy 30 thing. We're trying to be quote unquote, that? healthy for 30 days. This is just something he created. Um <laughs> and it's not like based on anything. And it's we're not drinking for 30 days. We're trying to work out every single day and we're just trying to be quote unquote healthy. Not sure totally what quote unquote healthy is, but That's a brave thing to do during quarantine. I know. I'm already regretting it now on day three. And and the best thing is are we day four? Day four. Okay. The best thing is um if one of us falters and doesn't have a, a good day, we both have to start over. So it's the stake. So you have to high. do this for 30 days. And by the way, we don't have to do it, but we have to do it. You know what I mean? So wait, you have to, you guys have to do this. Do you have to do this for 30 days and you have to do it together or you're starting over? Basically, if one of us uh, stops, that's the pact between us, um, or we have a bad day, we drink, we don't work out, we both have to start over. Well, the working out part is easier to hold yourselves accountable because I mean, are you guys working out together or are, uh, or are well, you just like, hey, I worked out. Like, what does workout even mean? Do you do a push up? That's it's actually a great question. For me, it's like going out for a run would qualify as one. Um, if sure, I'm inside, 
if I'm inside, then I want to do something for at least 20 minutes. That's my my kind of situation. But there are no set parameters between the two of you of what constitute a workout. Like if you did you know, five, it's a, good, it's a good point. If you did five squats, for, can I do that for 20 minutes? I, I don't. I. It's not my. It's it's not my health journey. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm just curious because but wait. like if you drink if you drink you're like oh well I cheated uh, but the working out very very uh, very it's great little, you got- I think for us it's like a 20 minute workout or a run okay. that's, the, that's the that's the and situation. you're on day four is there anything else other than not drinking and working out that this also includes can you eat whatever you want I think we're, the eating is a little bit of a gray zone, right? So I think we're trying to be healthy, but then last night we had takeout Thai food. So does that qualify as healthy? I don't know. I mean, listen, I think it's great that you and your boyfriend are doing this together and it's And somehow, somehow the look in your eyes feels like things haven't been quite figured out and you know it. I, uh, I give it 12 days. Yeah. Wow. I don't think you're I don't think you guys are gonna finish. I I'm ready for that challenge. Nothing motivates me more than someone. I, I don't know what I, I I know I don't know you well enough to make this type of a, a, a assumption and I don't know your boyfriend at all. Like literally. Uh, <laughs> but I like the assumption that's happening based on the five minutes we've met. Well, what I'm saying is this sounds like and I, I like listen, you guys are coming up with things to do during quarantine. Totally. And you're trying like, well, let's do a positive thing. Like let's be healthy. Some very loose parameters here, very easy to cheat. Or you know? is it easy to be flexible and motivate yourself a little bit more? That's all I'm saying. Well, Sure, that's what I'm saying. By like day 12 or 13, you'll be like, what are the rules again? I don't know. Like, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Like, I got out of bed. I worked out today. You know, <laughs> it's going to come down to that. Well, uh, my, but I'm my sure. Favorite part, I'm sh- my favorite part is the title. I'm like, Healthy 30 doesn't even really have a catchy ring to I it. I like it's that you like, guys gave it a title. It does. It makes I know. it. Yeah. Um, I do like that. It, it does make it very official, as if like there's. Uh, like you can search it on online or something and totally. get like all but, the. But my favorite part is like I'm not documenting on social media. Like it's really just for the two of us, which I think is hilarious. Um. So being on social media, I I, I know you've talked about this before. I've just learned this about you. You have a flip phone. I have a flip phone. Yeah. Why? <laughs> like, uh, tell me. Nick, I, I, like I you've talked about. Why this. not? Yeah, I feel like. Are you doing it to be ironic? No. Or is there a functional purpose? Okay. Okay. Few things. Few things. Let's break it down. First of all, walk me through this. First of all, let's let's let let me give you some background about this chick, right? So first of all, I don't love change, and I have had a flip phone my whole life. That was my first phone, and I just have kept having flip phones. It was just kind of like what I had. I was used to. I was like into it. Then when I was around 16 and I was like the second season of the Disney Channel show I was on, uh, everyone was like, you need to get social media. And I'm like, nah, I don't really want to get social media. And everyone's like, no, 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 you have to get social media. And so I was like, okay, let me look into it. And I got an iPad. So I got this iPad to do social media. And then, you know, it has all the other smart device aspects. You can do email, you can, you know, do other things, but the really big ones are email and social media, right? So... From there, that could have been the moment where I could have gotten an iPhone and made, you know, quote unquote life easier. But I liked one that my flip phone is indestructible. Like I've dropped it so many times. It's been like in soaking water, like everything it does. It just doesn't break. Right. (laughs) Um, If I and the iPad's big enough, it's a mini iPad, but it's big enough where I don't drop it the way I know I would drop an iPhone and break it in two seconds. I just know. I know myself. I know what would happen. Okay. Second. I do like the aspect of being able to separate myself from social media and emails, but not necessarily completely cutting people off from talking to me. So if people want to call me, um, texting is kind of hard on the flip phone, but if people want to call me, they can, and I still can be separated from not having the temptation of looking at my emails or social media and have that situation. Now that, um, 
all kind of went badly when I started dating someone who was an international um, person who had an international phone, phone number because I couldn't talk to him on my flip phone. So I had to bring my iPad with me in order to text and talk to him. Um, what, and you, and you, but still didn't feel like making the transition. Be like, you no. know what? This was a good run. I'll just get. I, I had it for years. I've had it like literally for years. It was like the way I was doing it. Um, so now he has a domestic phone. And so that has made things easier. But I feel like it has been broken a little bit. But the aspect still stands that I can just leave my iPad at home and not be tempted by email, tempted by social media, and still have the prospect of someone contacting me. If my family had to contact me, if my manager had to contact me. So yeah. I like that idea, right? It's not as um, foolproof as I would like it to be, but you know. I mean, it, I, it's fascinating. It's, uh, I give you a lot of credit for doing it. Um, and I don't there's know certainly if I need some better, credit. Well, there's certainly some benefits of, of, of what you're doing to do I'm assuming you find you find so when you're out and about and you are you just have your flip phone with you and you you've left your iPad at home and so people's ability to connect with you and your ability to like you know like you don't have internet access on your flip phone right no so while everyone else is at a party and buried their faces into their phones like what are you doing <laughs> like are you so to totally well and it's funny because it's like Sometimes I love that and sometimes I don't. So if I go to a red carpet, right, I'm like not prone to bring my iPad with me or I will, but it's just like an extra accessory that's with me. Um, but because of that, I'm not necessarily because it is a little bit bigger. It's not huge. It's a mini iPad. Just want to clarify. Um, yeah, I've, I've Chrissy's just like, no, it's actually ginormous. But, but here's um, the question. Here's the question. Like I get the, why don't you get like an old iPhone, but you still use it the same way as an iPad so that if you do take it out, you're not clunking around this mini iPad, which is still big. I think, I think, one, I'm stubborn. I'm going to, I'm going to admit it and accept that that is an issue. But two, it does complicate things because I would get a number on this iPhone. Like that's the whole thing. What's nice about my iPad is that it does have, <laughs> this is going to sound terrible, but it has cellular service. And so I can, if I have it with me, I can check email and social media on like the drop of a dime. But if I got an iPhone with cellular service, I would have a number. And then all of a sudden that does complicate things. Cause then it's people, I just know what's going to happen. It's going to be so like, now you're, like, you're holding out. You're holding well, out. Yeah. A, a little bit. I have to say, I don't think you're like it's that. Be you're like that person. You're like that person who like missed that. Like they didn't go and see Titanic like everyone else did. And then you just like really enjoyed telling people, I've never seen Titanic. You know what? I've never seen it. And now you defiantly won't watch it just because everyone's like, like every time you go to a party. Say, I have to say, I am a little that person, but that has, that joy for my life has faded a little bit because I've talked about the flip phone so much. So it <laughs> is more, I think, a stubborn thing from within where I'm like, I will not change but I know change is a good thing, and I know that it is inevitable. Like, I'm going to have to get an iPhone. It's just going to have to happen. Does your boyfriend like it? Like, what does he think about it? Or does it, I, I got to assume does that sometimes get frustrating for him? He thinks it's bullshit. He thinks every time I tell the story of being like, I, I can disconnect and I can, you know, have my flip phone. He's like, that's just not true. He's like, you have your iPad. You're on social media and emails with your iPad. Like, you're not disconnecting. And then I would argue with him being like, well, but I can if I want to. And if I go to the beach or anything, like there are times when I totally disconnect. I um, can if I want to. That's a, that's a wonderful excuse often used in any relationship. I can't. Well, I can if I want to. I mean, I don't <laughs> ever, but I can. I want, I, I can. like options. I like. I like know. options. I like it. Damn it. Uh, that's, that's great. So you have, uh, you have a new song that just came out last week. Congratulations. Uh it's called uh, Can't yes. Hold On Forever. Can't Hold On Forever comes out, yes, tomorrow or last week. Okay, no. okay, cool, yes. Yeah. Okay. It's out last week, people. It just came <laughs> out last Friday. Check it out. Uh, and then you dropped one uh, last month. 
yes. uh, when you wake up. Now I'm looking at these lyrics of the songs, and I'm curious. As a so you you write the songs. Yeah, yeah. As a songwriter, like, are you are you writing these based off your own personal experiences, or are they kind of a hybrid of like your experiences and like stories you heard from your friends, or just like what you see on the internet? Um, great question, and I think there's not a simple question for my songwriting process for all songs. But with those, I would say all of the above with what you just said with songwriting, right? But for those two particular songs, um, they're both interesting. One, When You Wake Up is definitely based on personal experience, but not necessarily the experience you would think. So obviously I put it in a situation where it's like, in itself, feels like a romantic personal relationship, feels like a booty call, <laughs> obviously. It sounds like you're you're dealing with a fuck boy and you want to totally. date him and he's just like, uh, I don't know, send nudes. And you're like, no, like, let's be in love. And you're like, he's just more like, send nudes, you know? I mean, right? Like, 100%. Is it, that's, that's kind that of the is, idea. That's the, me yeah. that's the metaphor. That's the metaphor. But it was actually... Yeah. my experience in a professional relationship that obviously did not involve sending nudes or involve a booty call, but the idea no, of I mean, kidding. What, what do you mean by professional? No, but <laughs> yeah. So basically I was in kind of the situation where I was super frustrated by professionally what was happening and more on the prospect of like things weren't changing and I didn't feel wanted in the way that I wanted to be wanted or appreciated in the way I wanted to be appreciated. Like, right. I was really kind of just wanted for one thing and I was super frustrated by that. And I, I, you know, with that frustration, I came into the session and wanted to have a song about being in relationship with someone who makes the same mistakes who keeps saying that they're going to change and they don't and who doesn't appreciate all of you. And what do you do? Like, do you walk away or do you stay with it? Um, obviously in songwriting, the key is not, you want it to come from personal experience on a, on your, your, the most ideal situation, but you have to be careful about making it too specific and too personal. Like if you're like professionally, like it just, it's not going to really connect to people, especially <laughs> Especially because I'm in the entertainment industry and it was coming from a person who's in the entertainment industry. And obviously a lot of my listeners aren't people who are in the entertainment industry. But this industry. wasn't someone you were, it's not like you were working with them professionally and you wanted something romantically. It was more of a metaphor of, of. Totally. They, you felt like you were being pigeonholed and you wanted to. Totally. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it was, yeah, it was a, a little bit of that and a little bit of getting promised something and then not having a follow through at all. Right. Well, and yeah. have you ever dealt with fuck boys and in, in before your loving boyfriend now? Oh, for sure. Oh yeah. But I'm not never in that, um, never having it go as far as getting intimate with them and then not following through on something, but for sure having, having a relationship where it's like, I mean, relationship seems like too intense of a word, but having a connection with someone and having a little bit of a, a mini fling and not having it go to the place that you want it to go. Like that's, I feel like in most very... of the relationships you've had, and I don't, I use relationships loosely because you know, friends are in a relationship. I don't mean like romantically all, all, all the time. But in your potential romantic endeavors, uh, do you find that you were the one who had more of the power or they had more of the power early on? You know, I think... I think like who was chasing who? I think I don't like to chase. I'm not a chaser. And I actually, this is going to sound kind of interesting, but I find it really unattractive when I have to chase. Like, I, I'm not sure why. I'm really actually quite you, thankful to have that mentality. When but you I, say unattractive, you, you see yourself as less unattractive? No, or you... I find it, this is going to sound weird, <laughs> but I find it, I'm not attracted to someone who I don't feel is attracted to me. Like if I feel like someone is not attracted to me and is not putting in the work, I like instantly don't feel attracted to them. It's, it's kind of an awesome thing in some ways, but in other oh, that's ways, great. 
I, it's, probably, it's the opposite of a lot of uh, young women out there. It, in some ways, though, I think that has been shaped by my uh, experience in being in the entertainment industry so young. You know, you have to understand I'm dealing on a professional level on a constant basis with rejection, with trying out for something and then mm. not getting someone being like, I don't want you. So I think in my personal life, I'm like, I don't have the time and energy for that. Either it's like you outwardly let me know that you're into me or I got to kind of move on. But with that, there have been times when I have had initial feelings for someone and then not felt an instant reciprocation or an instant something and kind of just like didn't pursue it. And then looking back, I'm like, well, that was, I think, a little bit motivated by fear as well, not sure. just a oh, I'm not attracted because they're not attracted to me. Like, I think there's a few handful of times I could say where the person could have been attracted to me and I just, because they weren't chasing me, I was like, oh, no, nah, man, I'm moving on. You know what I mean? Like, No, I get it. I mean, listen, I, we, we all can kind of overdo certain things, but it is probably a healthier approach than the, the latter of... Uh, we all have wasted a lot of energy and time chasing things that weren't available to us. Uh, well, that's so my I, business. That's like, yeah. that's the whole thing. That's like literally my professional life. And so to, that's already so psychologically exhausting. So to have that in my personal life as well, I'm like, I just, I can't, I don't want it. I can't. I'm so not the, the trick for people who do this in their personal life is to try to f get rejected all the time in their professional life. I don't know. I, mean, I don't know if it's. I don't know if it's shaped by that. I don't know if it's shaped by uh, my upbringing. Like my, I come from parents happily married and together, and I know they both went through their struggles before they met each other. But I feel like they did set up a pretty healthy dynamic between the two of them for me to see. Um, yeah. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. It's always been a thing where, I like I'm. I'm not a text first person, which I don't know if that's a good thing sometimes, but I'm not. That's a, not a, that's not a rule you have that you just don't like it. Yeah. Or is it I a rule? Know. Are you a rule person or you do have like, these are Laura's rules for herself and you have to follow or is it, you just don't feel like it? It's, it, it's a, it's an interesting question because I would say I don't feel like it, but with my current boyfriend, I felt like there was a rule in my head where which, okay, Nick, I'm, I'm curious to hear your opinion on this because I feel like I, he and I disagree about this. But if someone finishes the conversation, right? So you have two people and someone finishes the conversation, don't you feel like the next person should start the conversation? Give me an example. I'm not sure I'm following. So Chrissy have, has a look on have, her face like, what the <laughs> fuck? We have person I'm just a, like... <laughs> Chrissy's like, what are you talking about? No, 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 you guys get it. You'll get it. Let me explain. All person right, a, all right. Person A, person B, okay? I can already guess what point of view your boyfriend has, but continue. <laughs> person A and person B are talking, right? Yeah, yeah. Person A, by the way, the conversation isn't necessarily finished, but person A says the last thing. Like, person B just said a joke, and person A said, ha ha, that was funny, emoji yeah. or something. Conversation ends, right? Don't you feel like, <laughs> I like how shaping this. This, be this like, is on text? This is this is on text. Okay. Person A just finished it, said, ha ha, that was funny. But not so person A didn't necessarily try to finish the conversation, but it just kind of happened. It just organically Don't you feel ends. like, organically ends, don't you feel like person B more often than not should then restart that conversation rather than person A double texting being like, hey, how you doing today? No. I feel like I, this is a person I, who has I, a flip I, phone perspective. I agree. <laughs> yeah. No. Well, I actually find it ironically bizarre that you, because I can guarantee you your boyfriend is the one who's saying no, and you think that someone, there should be some sort of even balance, uh, which I do think I is do. ironic coming from the flip phone person that she has these rigid texting rules. Um what here's what I think. I think that I think that that all sounds nice. That's like a nicety. I, I, I don't. Is nicety even a word? Uh, it's like it something is. that seems nice. It sounds nice in theory. I get what you're saying, but if you're being literal with your interpretation, interpretation, then that sounds really exhausting. 
I just feel like why why am I going to put in that extra I've just finished the conversation I don't want to Is do this an actual relationship? Like this is between you and your boyfriend, right? This isn't now. This isn't now. This is a let me clarify. Early, early stages? Early stages before we were dating. This is like the okay. courting, the courting session. Okay. The courting it, then it's slightly less radical. Thank you. Uh, Thank however, you. However, however, I do think like when you're dating someone, a good sign that there's potential in this relationship would be that it does feel generally easy. And so this all happens organically. But if you are going to sit there and look at your text and go, I mean, I got something to say, but I can't say it because I text him last without a response. So I'm going to have to wait till he texts me to validate that he's into me before I say this very arbitrary and trivial thing only to get a ha 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 LOL. Like that seems like a lot of thought into like, you know what I'm saying? Like I understand you want the reciprocity and you want there to be an even feel, but like on a one for one basis, it seems a bit intense. I think it depends the situation and I think it depends the state and stage you are in in the relationship. Give so me I'm a stage in which you think this would be. Give me a stage in which you have like you're talking about Peter and butter and jelly sandwiches and you're like, okay. I cut my crust and you're like, I don't. And you're like, ha ha ha, <laughs> crazy. And then all of a sudden, like an hour goes by and you just want to be like you something popped in your head. Totally arbitrary. You're like, wait. Do you like grape or strawberry jelly? I didn't even ask you that. Like you're going to look at the text thread and see that they you text them last saying ha 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 and now you like have to wait to ask grape or strawberry? I think this is the wrong situation to look at it. I think it you have to think of it in the way of before dating. So it's like the courting situation. Okay. The conversation isn't necessarily about peanut butter and jelly, but yes, it could be an arbitrary conversation. And it's it's more in the way where neither one knows if the other one is into them and he lives in another country and all these Doesn't kind matter. of different things. But for me, I'm like, well, I don't want to... I I just finished the conversation or I was the last one to text. I don't want to. I don't know what you're doing. Are you working? What are you doing? I'm not going to like do a double text in that moment. If you're working, I don't want to bother you. I want you to do your thing. And then you just text me after you're done because I was the last person to text. I don't know. Uh, here's, here's, what I, here's what I think. I, I think, uh, and I mean this in the nicest way. I think you like control and... I agree with that. And... Uh, to you, it's more about because it's the you don't like the unknown. So you're just like, okay, well, so for sure. You text me last. If I send him a, a text, I recognize he could be busy doing something, sleeping. I don't know where he is. Like, oh, what time? I mean, you probably know the time. And if he doesn't respond back right away, I'm going to feel like I have less control. And then I'm going to get in my head and I'm going to start wondering what does it mean? And does he not like me? And then you're going to like spiral. And so for self-preservation purposes, you, you, you don't do that. Like you get ahead of the game. You, you seem to know yourself well enough to like I not think that's a do good, that. That is a good observation. I feel like for sure I like control. And I think for me, in the beginning of something, before even like dating is official, like the beginning of something, I'm like, well, I just have a lot of different things in my head being like, well, what's happening? What's going on? Are we on the same page? Like, what are you thinking? What am I thinking even? Once the dating aspect happens, I'm a little bit like, no, of course, the double text thing is out the window. Or you, you don't have to, double text is fine. Like I double text out all the time. It's ridiculous. But it's like the beforehand for me, I'm a little bit like, I have to see an equal reciprocation. I have to, like, I have to see it and I have to feel it if I'm going to go to the extra level and pursue it. I mean, listen, you're in, a, you have a, a boyfriend, so... Sounds like things are working out. Uh, I love, and I, I will say, I definitely, I uh, no, no, no. Actually, I personally, if listen, I think uh, there's always a balance, right? There's no, no one has a, a point of view or a position on something, and then kind of as you pointed out, it can have a lot of positives in your life, but there are some like negative aspects about anything that we have for sure uh, tendencies of doing. 
I think in general, it seems like, again, uh, a far, I, I would think that your point of view is more positive than the fact that, you know, knowing what you want, being confident and not chasing, uh, you know, boys or guys or like just not chasing affection that it isn't there is a far more healthier approach than being drawn to guys or women, if you're a guy, that they don't like you and, and which a lot of people do, you know. And then you run the risk if, uh, of having your soul uh, qualification of you liking them simply as they like you. It's like, what do you like about them? I don't know. They like me. You know, like, and so you run that risk where you, you seem to, that's your baseline, um, For which sure. I think is, is, is good. But yeah, within that, there, you, 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 like, you're definitely protecting yourself. And you he's like gonna, the, he's gonna love that you're on his team for this with the uh, yeah like, there's definitely some self preservation there yeah but it's I it's don't okay. disagree I don't disagree for sure it's funny though that it's um it is funny when you're in a relationship with someone I was in a relationship with someone before dating him so I my first year's relationship was before my current boyfriend and it is funny one um just the different ideas and ideals and mentality that you have when you're in a serious relationship with someone. And two, then when you're dating someone else and having to adjust and be flexible to a new ideals and mentality than the other new ideals mentality you just kind of like became flexible with. It, totally. it, it's interesting. If it doesn't work out with this gentleman and you start dating someone else, I would, I would, be curious if you'd be willing to try double texting someone and oh God. see what that feels like and get that rush of excitement to get out of Oh, man. Hey, listen, I, if, you, if it's a quadruple, if you're like sending five messages on response, that's a red flag or a bad sign. But uh, I think that it's always fascinating. You think the second text is fine. Well, I've always like, I'll do on my questions with Nick, I always get a lot of questions about like, he's a bad texter. And quite honestly, I've never really understood. I mean, I know what they mean, but I don't, I don't get that. Like, as if that's like an actual dating quality. I mean, I understand that's a form of communication that we, as a society, heavily rely on, but that's not like a qualification as a person. I don't know. So, no, like, for sure. so much effort and 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 strategy goes into texting, which I still it's think, insane. like, yeah, like. Texting is a great way to communicate with someone with people we know, you know, with people we have relationships with, people like we've met and like understand their sense of humor and things like that. It's like it's an efficient way of communicating so that we don't have to like call and talk because we can get yes or no answers. It's not a way to meet, get to know someone. Like but it's, when you're in a long, so we had to start long distance right away. Sure. So when you're a long distance, even on the courting situation, it it's all on text. That's the whole thing. It's funny. Um, yeah, but you can f FaceTime and Zoom and. Well, and we didn't FaceTime for a really long time. Um, so you spent a long time getting to know someone without like talking and seeing like their body language and and. Totally. Like, like when you say something and I'm looking at you now, you're smiling, right? And you could say it. God. And I yes. know that you're saying or or versus like you text it like short of like, you know. Well, I got to send like four emojis to let her know I'm not being sarcastic, but like how many <laughs> totally. emojis can I send without her thinking he's sending too many emojis? I don't. I don't. Like, well, strategy. See, strategy. No, I know there is. It's, it's, a, it's a thing. It's like, so for my, my first birthday of us um, being together, like being in a relationship together, we, well, what's funny is we, um, we met and we didn't start dating for a really long time. So we actually met writing can't hold on forever and which is a whole other kind of conversation story so you but, guys you guys co-wrote the, you, you and your current boyfriend yeah, co -wrote and, this song and his brother and one of his really good friends and then this other guy that no one really knew in the session but he got said in the session so it was actually quite a a large session i remember in my calendar uh he and his brother sometimes go they don't really but they sometimes go as like the mac bros and i have in my calendar of like you have a session with like the mac brothers here blah blah and i come in there's like four guys and i'm like how big is this family how many brothers are there um but it was really just two of them and then two extraneous guys um chrissy knows the other guy shane was there as well and and then um i got him justin but so we met and 
we, nothing happened. There wasn't any kind of situation. Um, I had a boyfriend and he lived in Australia. So in my head, I'm like, oh, there's no prospect. It was a professional relationship. And songwriting is a, a funny professional relationship because you go real intimate and real deep right away. Like that's, you meet someone for the first time in a day and you're like, okay, what are your deepest fears? What do we, what are your biggest insecurities? Speak poetry to me. <laughs> totally. It's, it's a weird <laughs> dynamic. It's a super strange dynamic. And when I first started co-writing, it was a dynamic I wasn't super into and used to. Like I was, I would always, um, I'm not sure if you know this, but I like self-preservation. Um, but I, I would always tell what I wanted to write about in story form, meaning, or like in third person being like, well, I think what happens is that the girl in the song, she's feeling this, this, or this. Like I couldn't say I, or I couldn't say this is my experience. Um, cause it was uncomfortable. It's like you meet someone for the first time and you're like, this is what just happened to me. And I'm so happy about it or upset about it and mad, angry, sad. Um, but when I, when I went through my breakup, it was the first breakup I ever went through. I truly, I'm not sure what it set in me. I was also going through kind of like professional issues at the same time. And I like got so personal and intimate in my sessions. Like I was just like bearing my soul and I wrote the best music I ever had. Did um, you, and then when you were honest with like your actual feelings that, that I'm assuming you felt a little bit more uh, empowered or safer. I mean, like I think sometimes yeah. the, fear, but I, the reason I ask, like when we, we're guarded and we don't want to like things to get out there about who we really are, um, because we're always afraid, especially in today's age of like the cancel culture. And then you put something out there, which is again, like just vulnerability and then have people accept you for it. I'm assuming that was a great experience. Great experience. And I think for me, it was like, it sounds a little, um, it sounds a little cheesy, but there was suddenly this realization of how empowering, how empowering it was to be vulnerable. Like there was a lot of power and strength in being vulnerable that I wasn't used to and I felt really good about it. Um, and it was scary sometimes. And, you know, I was, I went through like every detail. I would go over the story of what had happened, like in so many different sessions. I did, um, you know, uh, writing camps where basically you are writing three to four songs a day. And so I would literally be going over the story of what had happened um, like three or four times a day. So that was like a little sometimes emotional. But you, you were the heartbroken one in that relationship? It's complicated. It's a complicated nah, it's, one. It is. It mixed. is. And see, that's... <laughs> no, Nick, because no, this not. is actually... This was my frustration, actually. My frustration was I was the one who initiated the breakup. But it... Okay. What was frustrating to me and actually from like a music perspective, you know, you know, when you're going through it. But let me ask you this, knowing you and I mean, by knowing you for 38 minutes, <laughs> did you uh, did you initiate the breakup because you felt like he, he he was falling out of love with you and to protect yourself, you broke up with him uh, and try to beat him to the punch because you felt like it was coming? Um, No, it okay. is like it is. It is, a, I, I think it might be a story for another time because it's a pretty intense story. Right. And I think what I was frustrated by was even though I'd initiated it and it was coming from me, I was still heartbroken. Like, yeah, totally. You I can was be still, and I think that was what was frustrating to me is even looking into music and looking into different things. It was like, there was a level of either with songs, whenever there were breakup songs, it was always from the perspective of like being broken up with, like I, the, there's this devastation and blah, blah. But there really are rarely any songs that talk about the heartbreak that come when you initiate it, when you are like, you're still in love with someone, but you're like, this isn't working for this, this, and this reason. Um, and it was, it was tough. It was a really, it was a weird thing. And, and around the same time, it was a very weird moment in my life. I went to go like film a movie and blah, blah, blah after, after kind of it happened officially. And around the same time, my current boyfriend who is in Australia, we started texting a little bit more. And so that was kind of the born from that situation, something that I did not expect to happen at all. 
Um, and so it was this weird moment of like dealing with my breakup and dealing with the heartbreak from that, but then also falling in love at the same time, which I never thought ever, ever, ever that I would be the kind of person that went from one relationship to another. Like I always looked at those people as, oh. How long of a process though? Like, you know what I'm saying? You, so how long? we broke up in and some people, Yeah, some people go from like a day to a day. So like dealing with a breakup and meeting someone is not that big of a, it's not. Yeah, and I think I think that was kind of interesting for me too. I think you asked earlier about rules, right? For me having rules. And I think without me even knowing it, I had built rules in my head based on my parents' relationship, based on other things where I sure. thought this is what happens. And I, I think what you realize at a certain point is life is going to happen. Like life is life. There are no rules sometimes and you just have to adjust and act in the best way you can with the situation that is presented to you. And so I, we broke up in April and then my current boyfriend and I, we weren't official. We like, we're talking a little bit, but we weren't official until July, but we had been talking like a bit. So it was, but when did you first start it? When did you first start talking? First start talking? Well, it was, it was weird, right? Because we, we had had a professional relationship before and we wrote this song and we had kind of written a few other songs, me, him and his brother. Um, so we had been talking like in and out in a little bit um, from that. And that was like way down the line further. And then when I broke up with my boyfriend and I was kind of like, there's a little something here. I was in Georgia filming a movie and we I kind of started initiating a little bit more, but then this is where it kind of comes in where I was, but I also was like, if he, I'm not going to double text. Like if he, this is when the double texting kind of came in. So like in May, in May-ish. Um, and then we had, we had our first FaceTime and in like end of May and we had like a really kind of frank, honest conversation. And from there, from all of June, it was like we were we were definitely on the same page about certain things. And then July was like finally making it official. And he's you're quarantining, quarantining with him. Yes, he has his own place. So he also, I mean, he is funny because he still works from home. He, even before quarantine, mm -hmm. he le works because sure. he yeah. is a songwriter. Um, but yeah, so he kind of goes from my place to his place or vice versa and that kind of situation. Nice. Now, and now your new song, it's different than your last song in April, more about uh, embracing the moment. Yes, totally. Which is kind of like, honestly, like, it's like something a fuckboy would say. Be like- Oh, 100%. So like well, your two songs are kind of fighting against each other. Like your two, like your one song's like, I mean, I want more, I'm in love. And then the other song is like the fuckboy and me like, let's just like- let's not worry about tomorrow. Like, let's just live in the totally. moment, you know? Let's get naked, you know? <laughs> well, to be honest, I actually love that because I feel like these group of songs that are coming out that I'm putting together and I'm still in the process of writing some and blah, blah, blah. But the whole idea of these songs is that they're offering different perspectives, right? So my last EP last year was the Me EP and it was kind of my perspective on certain things. And so this new era of music is the you era. Mm -hmm. And the goal for me is writing and having these different perspectives throughout the, throughout the releases and throughout the songs. So each you means something different to me, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, it, it's uh, it makes total sense. And uh, we all want different things at different moments. And sometimes totally. we are the, uh, you know, and it's always, sometimes. it depends on, and it always just depends on how we're feeling, you know, um, you know, the person who likes someone who's not feeling like maybe they're afraid that they don't, they're not being liked in return. They're, they're, they want more. And the other person in a different situation, you're like, you're crushing on someone and you're just like, I don't know if I want to marry you, but you're hot, you know? So let's, let's just let's focus have a on, right? Let's, let's have a again. moment, you know? I don't want to make promises I can't keep, you know? Um, totally. So, and everyone's like that, men and women. Um, well, even just talking about like the different perspective, my favorite thing is 
Tom, my boyfriend, and I, right, we, we wrote this song. Um, and in my perspective, exactly what you thought. Like, it is, I wouldn't necessarily, necessarily say it's like a fuckboy moment, but it's a moment of like, hey, we have this moment right here, right now. Let's just be together. Let's just have our moment. Let's be present with each other. But in his head, when we're writing the same song, I thought we were on the same page. He was like, when we talked about it, like months after, he's like, I thought it was a breakup song. And I'm like, it's definitely not a breakup song. It's definitely a like, let's be here. I don't know you. Let's like make the most of this moment. Let's just make some bad decisions and see what totally. tomorrow brings us. I don't know. Like, you But know? I love that his perspective is that it was a breakup song. And I'm like, I guess looking at it, if you can look at that, I guess. But I did not get that when I was writing it. I well, I mean, it could be a breakup song in the sense it's like, we're going to like have some fun tonight and tomorrow, ugh, not we're so done. much. You know, like. <laughs> totally. <laughs> So there is, there is that. Uh, I have, I've always been curious, you know, uh, you know, obviously you got your start, you know, being on in kind of part of the Disney family, uh, which has a certain brand totally. of kind of wholesomeness. Um, and especially now when we, you know, have the culture, that, like I'm assuming your fans have a level of expectation, especially kind of your OG fans, uh, is that who you are? Do you struggle with that? And do like, do you ever like want to like put things out there, whether it's on social or just act a certain way? And, and then you're afraid that you're not living up to this kind of uh, wholesome expectation that uh, anyone expects of you? Or is this, or, or, or like, are you just generally a wholesome person? You're like, this is super easy for me. I think three things, three things, right? So I think one, it's funny because I have been in the business before Austin Alley, right? So I started acting when I was five. I like have, I was in kind of actually a bit more adult stuff. I was in the Sarah Silverman program. I was in super bad. Um, and with that, I always looked at my job at Disney channel as something that I was crazy grateful for because it was like, I could do music finally. So that was mm -hmm. awesome, but it was a job, right? It was, and it's funny because Disney, for sure, like it means a lot of things to people. It, it has, you know, their brand that they are really, um, you know, careful about. But I always had the aspect of like, this is a job. I'm getting employed by someone. I love working with the people I'm working with. I love the Disney family, but they aren't also totally necessarily like a family. Like it's a job, right? So I think having that perspective was super helpful for me because a lot of people do start with Disney Channel and it's very confusing because it really does feel synonymous with who they are. It feels like their employer is their family and that gets really confusing when they're like, well, I want to do different things or blah, blah, blah. And I think that kind of gets a little messy, right? Two, I think a lot of my fans from Austin Alley, you have to understand it was on when I was 15. I'm 24, almost 25, 10 years later. So my fans have grown up with me. Now, obviously with Disney Plus, like you're getting a whole new age and demographic of fans, but a lot of these fans have grown up with me and are expecting content that is authentic and genuine to me, right? It wouldn't make sense for me to make the same music, make the same decisions, make the same, any sort of choices that I would at 15, right? It's like, that just doesn't make sense. I'm, I'm, it's almost 10 years later. Um, but with all that said, I, whether it's posting on social, whether it's writing a, a lyric in a song, whether it's choosing my acting projects, I definitely always have two minds about it. For me, the first mind is like, how does it genuinely authentically make me feel? Like, does this feel right with my journey? Does it feel right with who I am right now? And two, then I think of like, you know, for my EP last year, I had a song called F-E-O-U. That's for fuck each other up. And that song was like, for me, oh, is this, what does this mean putting it out? Like, what does this mean for people who follow me who are younger? What happens when I perform it? Like, I did have all these questions because for me, I... It's, it is a, it's a strange thing, right? You do have people who look up to you or who are younger. You have, for me, I'm actually never worried necessarily about the younger kids. I'm worried about the parents. I'm like, I'm like, oh God, I'm like, what are they going to think? Um, and I think the decision I always kind of come to is, well, 
does it make sense with me? And does it feel like something I would say or something that is genuine? And if it is, if it makes sense for my journey and if it is genuine, then I'm like, yes, like that, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make it happen. But, you know, even with social media, I have a, I have a thing of like, do I, do I curse on social media? Right? Like, do I write the word fuck? Do I write the word shit? And it's always a little bit like, well, I actually feel weird texting the word fuck and shit. Like I just, that isn't genuine to me at all. I can say it. Like I'm, I'll say yeah, it. Yeah, I kind of agree with you there. I don't, I mean, you I, know what I, mean? Like, I, I, I have I, a, I, I swear a lot, but when I'm, I don't often write it out. Yeah. I don't know. It feels weird to write it I'll out. Put like a, I'll put like an at symbol <laughs> or, or an asterisk. But, Totally. I don't know. But like for even texting, I'm like, I don't do that. So why would I tweet that or Instagram that? But I know that I know I have friends. I I know lots of people who do text it all the time and who do feel completely authentic and genuine posting and using it. But I'm like, that just doesn't totally make sense for me in on a regular day basis. So why would I put that a part of my brand anyway? If, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, totally. Um, it's always just kind of fascinating. Like obviously the, totally. the most known example is like the Miley, Miley Cyrus where she went from, she, there was a, you know, distinct kind of, okay, I'm done being Hannah Montana and I'm going to be Miley Cyrus now. And in, in case you weren't sure what that meant, she made it very clear. Uh, but I think Miley is the queen of doing whatever feels authentic to her you know what i mean and i sure think yeah she and so has like sh- do you ever use that as like you know you're not gonna necessarily go the same path what she did because that's authentic to her and may not be authentic to you but you know i no one is i mean i'm just kind of the anarchist where like no one's if you say you're you know super genuine and you're just like this you know rule follower you know whatever like there are I'm listening. You have skeleton. Everyone has things they say or do, or you know, a dirty joke they tell in their head, or like totally. a sense of humor, or or we all do things. And sometimes it's a lot of people will be like, "Well, you know, I know I'm not perfect, obviously." And then you totally. ask them to like talk about it. They're like, "Well, I'm not really sure. I'll have to get back to you." But, um, <laughs> but yeah. So it's just the question of just kind of putting that actually out there has got to be. Uh, something you you I am think I, about. I I think less necessarily about my quote unquote brand and more just because of the psychological effects of social media. I'm very careful about what I post. But I think that comes even from you know, I don't know how you feel, but like every time for Twitter for example, I'm like is this funny? Is this is this relevant? Does this make sense? Like sure. I overthink it for sure. And so And I think that necessarily, I think that does come more with how social media is, social media can be such a weird thing. And it's really weird to use it as a business platform and as a social platform. You know, I use it for both, as I'm sure you use it for both too. And that's like, those are really two different hats to wear. And it is, it's strange and they overlap and that happens. But I definitely am an overthinker when it comes to, when it comes to posting, because I just think it's hard to put who you genuinely are in the moment through 143 characters or through a photo that was taken at a photo shoot or any of those kind of different things, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, do you, so wait, you were on Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Yes. Like one of the, are you still smarter than a fifth grader? I was. Because I, I, I remember watching the first show and being like, I'm definitely not. I'm stupid, apparently. I was an OG. Uh, I was an original grader. I um, I did a game the other day for like a press thing where they asked me actual fifth grade questions, and I passed. You did. I was yes, but you still got it. <laughs> I played. I played that game with the same press outlet a year prior, and I did not pass. So uh, maybe. I'm how did you? In. How did? How did that happen? Like, were you just like your your parents knew someone who knew someone, or like were you yeah, just a really was... smart person? <laughs> no. Well, I, I listen. I love school. I do. I'm <laughs> I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, I knew we're family friends with the person who was one of the heads of Fox, that one who was like overseeing the show, and so he 
knew me really well. He knew I was a fifth grader. He's like, would you want to be on the show? And I'm like, oh, this seems awesome. The big thing for me was like, is this going to uh, compete with pilot season? Um, but it was like a super nonchalant, easy thing. And it was exciting for me that my friends could actually see me in a show because they hadn't been able to see me in a show before that. And I don't think anyone actually believed I was an actress. I think they just thought I said I was an actress. Um, I'm like, haven't you seen the first uh, season of Dexter? Um, and my 10 year old friends were like, no. Uh, but- Wait, are you on the first season of Dexter? <laughs> yeah. Who are you? I'm like, I'm young Deb. You're young Deb? I know, which I actually don't really look like Jennifer Carpenter, but I think she's awesome. I was like, so I, I, I might be the coolest thing for me that you've ever done, but. <laughs> I, I was, I didn't watch the show then because I was quite I'm so, so good. I'm going to so go back and look now. It's, it's such a good show. I'm like, and my sister, weirdly, she's an actress as well. She was on the fourth season of Dexter, playing a completely different character. Who not was she? To do it. She was Trinity's daughter. Trinity Killer's daughter. Wow. Yeah, I know. And I'm like, I always say, Vanessa, not to be controversial, but I'm like, we were on the best season of Dexter for sure. Come on. First season one and season four. Give me a those were, yeah, Those were some of the better ones. Season two is really good. Three, season and, and then after as far as I'm concerned, you can stop watching after season four. But... Uh, one yeah. and four, one and four were one, two, and four are the best seasons. I I have to say, like rewatching it, I I think as a fan because when I first watched it one time, I was the same way. I was like, after four, it's I'm not into it. But rewatching it, there is some merit in some of the later seasons as well, for sure. I mean, they're not like five's fine. It gets really weird after that, it and gets then I don't whatever so the last. Weird. Yeah, but like they were like the last season is useless, but. Uh, I think five was okay, uh, but it wasn't. It wasn't quite, quite the same. It was like, okay, how many serial killers does he live <laughs> with? Like, was. I mean, how many? Like, like everyone, season, every third person in Miami is a serial killer. <laughs> season four was unbelievable. Season, season four, four was like awesome, crazy. Um, but yeah, well, so basically, my friends could actually see Arius more than a fifth grader, so I was super excited about that. But yeah, it was a little stressful. It was a little like, oh, you have to know, you have to know your shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like you're ha- you're asking all these different questions and different subjects. And some of these contestants are going to depend on you. And man, I was, I was stressed for sure. All right, Laura, we're going to, we're going to wrap things up with a little game that we play. Oh dear. Chrissy is, is yes. going to join us. It's our, <gasps> am I going to join you? Yeah. Yeah. Our, it's called, do you know me? It's oh. real simple. Um, <laughs> is this technically game? technically Chrissy? You should win. I uh, I generally win at these things, but, okay. uh, but I, if, if it's what I think it is, Chrissy's going to dominate. Uh, we'll see. I uh, feel like I'm going to fail miserably. No, no, no. This is all about you, Laura. So, do you know oh. me? It's like there okay. are these random questions. So, I'm going to ask a question. You know, okay. does Laura X, Y, or Z? Does Laura this or that? Okay. Don't answer immediately, Laura. Christy and I are going to guess okay. the answer. So got this. All right. We're going to play. It's going to have five questions. And if you have an anecdotal story, feel free to share it. And there's no pressure to elaborate. You can simply just answer the question. And we'll right. go from there. Uh, ready? Do you know me with Laura Morano? So question much. number one. Can Laura name five Tom Cruise movies? Can Laura name five Tom Cruise movies? Uh, I'm going to... Now, she's a... You know, certainly Tom Cruise. And you... Sequels do, <laughs> don't count. Sequels okay, don't... Sequels don't count? No. Okay. Like, you can name one of the movies in the in the series of movies that he might have done for a franchise, if you will. You get what I'm saying, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but like one, two, <laughs> three, four, five don't, does not count. Uh, I'm still going to think Laura can do it. I think it's, she's going to struggle with four and five, but she can pull it off. I don't think she can do it. Okay, is it, is it mine? My turn? Go ahead. Yeah. 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 See if you can do it. I think you're not sure, but. Mission Impossible. Okay, yes, one. <laughs> Risky Business. Two. Jerry Maguire. Three. Rain Man. Four. Tropic Thunder. Five. Boom. 
Well played. Off to a commanding lead. <sighs> Nick one. Chrissy zero. <laughs> Uh, Chris is going to come in. Uh, question number again. two. Has Laura read her horoscope this week? Has Laura read her horoscope this week? Oh. Um, I'm going to say no. I think uh, Laura isn't into horoscopes as much as other people might be. She's read her horoscope. She knows her horoscope. She's not into horoscopes as much. I would agree. Besides, I don't think you can look it up on your flip phone. So... Okay, so no, I did not look at my horoscope this week, but I'm actually super into horoscopes. Okay, I, I still got it right, but you still never got it right, but no, I did not. I did not look at it this week. Uh, okay, all right, got one. Two to one. Two to one. Can Laura spell the word handkerchief? Can Laura spell the word? handkerchief uh hard for me to answer because they're for a million dollars i couldn't do this off the top of my head without writing like if you were asking me this question uh, uh laura I, I i believe she can uh, are you smarter than a fifth grader uh, nerd yep uh, um agree i have the spelling in front of me um okay so handkerchief um Okay, so I would say... This is like a spelling bee. I, I do it know. like a spelling bee. I know you're talking about And I'm... I'm, I'm, welcome, I'm happy to use it in a sentence for you. <laughs> what, is the, uh, what is the root? What is the origin of handkerchief? <laughs> um, I have two questions in my head of certain things. I'm like in between. But let me go for it. I'm not sure, guys. I'm going to be honest. But I really appreciate the, uh, the confidence. H A N K E R C H I E F. Close. You forgot the D. Handkerchief. It's hand. It's handkerchief. Pronounced. You know. I, I, I knew it. there was something missing. You forgot the D. <sighs> okay. Wow. It's okay. The score is still the same. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Chrissy's like, it's fine as long as Nick didn't get an extra one. Uh, and last question. Can Laura name the president on the $20 bill? Can Laura name the president on the $20 bill? I do know this answer. I'm going to say she can. I want to say Andrew Jackson. Correct. Uh, yes. all right. Uh, well, that's, those are, those are five. I mean, I won. I mean, I don't know if we won. Is that five? Was that five or four? That was four, was five. right? Fine. Okay. I don't know. saying. Right? It was the Tom Cruise question. All right. Two quick question. ones. I think I know the answer to both of these. One, can <laughs> Laura drive a stick shift? And I mean a, I mean a car. Um, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no as well. And uh, is Laura part of the Mile High Club? Also, no. No. I don't think so. Okay, well, I guess I'm very predictable because yes, no to both of those. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think either one is mutually exclusive. Um, or maybe everyone who drives a stick shift just knows how to how to get it done in, in an airplane. Um, it's possible. But, <laughs> maybe. But yeah, no to both. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, close one. Uh, that first, that first uh, Tom Cruise. How do you, I mean, he's done so many. He's done uh, so many. And Tropic Thunder is one of my favorite films. That was a great, that was a great, I, I wasn't even thinking about that one, but that was a, that was uh, a great, uh, great And plug. he's so, he's so crazy. One of his best it's roles. Like his best role, yeah. I think so too. Yeah, it was really good. Uh, Laura, thanks so much for joining. It's been a ton of fun. Uh, can you uh, plug all the things you're doing right now and where can people find you if they want to check out your new song or follow you on social and et cetera, et cetera. Yes. Um, well, I have two new songs out right now. Can Hold Forever, as you said, came out last week. You can stream that and listen to that on any platform that you would love or choose. When You Wake Up came out last month. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Laura Marano, which is L-A-U-R-A-M-A-R-A-N-O. And then 
Facebook's Laura Morano official. Just got a TikTok. I actually, I think my TikTok's Laura Morano. I don't know what it is, to be honest. How, um, how are your TikToking skills? So I was, on dancing? It, I, I was on it when it was Musical.ly. And then I like forgot my password and wasn't on it for years because it was used to be Musical.ly. And it was, now that was a platform that was the platform. And then TikTok bought musically. I'm not sure what happened, but it's like I had a musically account. So I had a TikTok account gotcha. without having the TikTok account. Um, yeah, you know, it's it, TikTok's an art. It's 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 a full on art that I don't know. I was into it for like four days and then I, <laughs> totally. you know, I still have it. I don't know. But you did it with style, Nick. And that's yeah. what matters. That's what matters. <laughs> I just don't have it in me to like spend an hour like it's so long to like learn a dance and it's just like it's like if i did it once it's funny ironically you know but then it's just like i don't you're like i can't keep doing it yeah focus my time on roller skating (laughs) uh well well laura it's been a a pleasure thank you so much for joining us uh congratulations congrats on all the success that you have uh are having and uh continued success and look forward to seeing more of you in the future Thank you. Thank you. This is so lovely. And uh, I love Chrissy so much. <laughs> she, she is the greatest. She uh, is the greatest. <laughs> Well, guys, thanks for listening. Uh, as always, don't forget to send your questions at asknickacastme.com, cast with a K for Ask Nick episodes. Thanks for listening, and we will see you on Monday. <laughs>